Hey everyone, hope quarantine's treating you well. My name is Lindsay Wright and I work here at the Great Plains Nature Center and my favorite thing in the whole world is fungus. And I usually get a lot of weird looks when I say that to people, but it's the truth. So today I'm gonna take a little bit of time and talk about the mystical morel mushroom. And over the course of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about what you need to understand about them first, what to take with you and some safety precautions to be aware of, where you can look to find them, how to identify them, what false morels are, and how to clean and cook the morels that you find. So, to start us off, what makes a morel so great? I'm sure most of you have probably heard about a morel. Well, this is kind of what they look like. Actually, not kind of, this, this is what they look like. Um, they're great because they're early risers. And what I mean by that is they usually come up in the springtime and it's early spring. So they start popping um, late March and they usually last through early May. It kind of depends on the weather and the environment situation that's going on. Um, they're easy to identify once you learn how. They're really, really delicious. Um, but in my opinion, chanterelles are even more delicious, but that's for another video. And they're also incredibly good for you. So to start us off, um, we need to talk about what a mushroom exactly is so you can really understand these mushrooms a little bit better. So what is a mushroom? We all know the five major kingdoms. Two of the really big ones are the kingdom of plants and the kingdom of animals. But if you look closely at these images, you don't really see any mushrooms on either of those categories. And that's because a mushroom is neither a plant nor an animal. It's more closely related to humans than it is to plants, which is kind of odd to wrap your head around. Um, like some animals, mushrooms have um, chitin and they have cells that have uh, glycogen in them and they're really, it's more similar to arthropods. Um, plants have cellulose, they also lack chlorophyll, they're heterotrophic, which means that they need to get their food from an outside source, they can't make their own food. They're terrestrial, they're multicellular, and it consists of things like mushrooms, molds, mildew, yeast, uh, plant pathogens, smuts and rust, and parasitic fungi that can even infect human beings. So, with all of that in mind, they actually get their very own kingdom because they're so different from really anything else. So what exactly is a mushroom? Well, a mushroom is the fruiting body of a bigger fungal organism. So if you look here, this white stuff that's underneath this mushroom is called the mycelium, which is the actual body of that fungus. And these mushrooms that are poking up out of the ground are actually just the fruiting body or the reproductive part. So when you find a mushroom, you're looking at one teeny tiny piece of it and not the larger picture. So it's, think of it as like an apple to a tree. It's just one part of it and it helps it reproduce. So what are these mushrooms doing where they're growing? So they take on three major ecosystem roles. The first one is saprobic, which means that they're decomposing organic matter. The second one is mycorrhizal. So they're having these really intimate and special relationship with trees and other plants. And then the last one is parasitic. And that can consist of parasites on insects, plants, and even on humans, like I've mentioned before. So keep in mind that these are major roles that these mushrooms are playing. And in the case of morels, there is some back and forth in science right now, whether they're truly mycorrhizal or if they're actually saprobic. So if they're in the ground decomposing organic matter or if they have relationships with certain kinds of trees because normally they're found being associated with certain types of trees. So when you're ready to go out looking for these mushrooms, now that you have a better understanding of what a mushroom actually is, what do you take with you? Um, you need to take proper clothing. And what I mean by that is long sleeves, long pants, tall socks, closed-toed shoes. It's gonna look really silly, but tuck your pants into your socks. That's gonna save you a lot of trouble, especially with ticks and avoiding getting into any of those tick-borne illnesses. Um, you'll need to take with you sunscreen and bug spray. You're gonna be out in the sun. Um, even if you're in the shade, you're still being exposed to that UV radiation, and bug spray is gonna help you along the way. There are lots of mosquitoes out there, and again, ticks are a bit of an issue. You'll wanna take a 
basket or a mesh bag. You don't ever want to use plastic bags. That's because just like plants need to breathe, mushrooms also need to breathe. So when they're in a plastic bag, you're restricting the flow of air and that will in turn result in early rotting of these mushrooms and they'll start to decompose a lot faster. Plus, if they're all kind of piled on top of each other with not a lot of space, they're gonna start crushing the ones on the bottoms, thus somewhat ruining your prize mushrooms that you just put a lot of effort into finding and picking. Um, you also want to take a knife with you, and that's because when you actually find a mushroom, you want to cut it at the base of its stem. Don't ever just pull it out of the ground. You'll risk damaging that mycelium and potentially harming future fruitings of that mushroom. And finally, if you're, if you're going to be out for more than a couple of hours, you'll want to take water and snacks with you. We also got to talk about safety. So it's advisable that you never pick alone and you should always have some way of communicating with people who aren't with you and always, always tell people where you're going and when you're expected to return. You'll want to have um, water, snacks, a lighter, a first aid kit, and always bring bug spray because you never really know what's going to happen. Um, and then picking in urban environments, as you can see in this photo here on the left, Someone found some morels in their yard, but there's a house and a road right there. It's not advised that you pick in urban or industrial areas because it's arguably dangerous. Whatever is in the environment or in that soil is probably gonna be in those mushrooms too. So avoid picking mushrooms near heavy traffic, near waste disposal sites, or even around heavy industrial processing. Also, be respectful of private property. That kind of goes without saying. So when you're ready to go out and look, once you've got all your stuff packed up and you're ready to go, where are you going to look for these guys? Well, temperature and moisture are by far the most important factors for morel growth. Morels will not grow if the soil is too warm or too cold. It's kind of like the whole Goldilocks thing. They always tend to like really moist soil, and I've found them often in really sandy soils, so soils that have really good draining. Um, keep a note of weather patterns and not just in the springtime but make note of how it is in the winter time because if there's a lot of snow during those wintery months there's a good chance you're going to have a really good fruiting for those morels in the springtime so it's good to pay attention to weather patterns especially several months before the morel season is about to start um, they really like disturbed ground uh, clear cuts and wildfire burns um, they all tend to precede a bloom in morel growth. And remember that symbiotic relationship that we talked about, that mycorrhizal one, um, one of the hypotheses is that the disturbance disrupts the connection between the fungus and the roots of the host trees. So for example, if um, the tree that this mushroom might have a relationship with is cut down, the mushroom is like, oh no, there goes my food supply how, I mean, I should probably reproduce and get out now while I can. So that mycorrhizal relationship is an interesting one because the mushroom mycelium is really small compared to a tree root hair, so it can actually absorb more water and nutrients than a tree root hair can on its own. So the mushroom is giving it water and nutrients and the tree is giving that mushroom carbohydrates and sugars that it needs. So if that tree gets burnt or cut down, that mushroom is like, man, I gotta reproduce right now. So you're likely to find a large fruiting of mushrooms um, in areas that have been recently burned or where trees have been cut down. So like I said, stick to recent burn scars where the trees are dead, but there's still some foliage around um, and partial and clear cut forests are also pretty good, good places to look. Remember that where you find one morel, you're likely to find others. Um, and if it's really early in the season, we're actually coming up on the season right now. I've been getting reports about some morels in um, like Leavenworth County. There have been some down in Arkansas City. They're starting to pop up in Kansas. So um, this is what I would consider the very beginnings of the season. Um, so at this time, it's best to look over the south and the west side of the slopes of the hills. And that's where the sun actually shines the longest during the day at this point. So it'll have warmer soil. So you're more likely to find them on the south and west side of slopes than you are on the other sides. Um, if you couldn't tell from that photo, that red circle is now circling that little morel that's in that image, which um, can kind of give you an idea of how well camouflaged that they are. So when you're looking, you need to look really hard. Also, timing is everything. So early spring, um, like I said, late March, 
to early May, it depends on the weather situation. Usually it's when the temperatures in the day stay around 60 degrees and the lows don't get below 40. That's just too cold for them. Also, you're gonna wanna look after a really good rain because they love moisture. Mushrooms cannot reproduce or create those fruiting bodies um, without a really high amount of moisture. It's also, there's an old saying, I never really go by it, um, but there's one that a lot of people I know go by it, and it's when the oak leaves are the size of mouse's ears, then it's time for time to look for morels, which leads me to my next segment. You gotta know your trees, because if you don't know your trees, um, you might struggle to find these morels. Um, there's a lot of evidence out there that suggests that maybe there is a relationship with certain kinds of trees where morels actually favor like cottonwoods and elm trees rather than um, say locust trees so know your trees the ones that i have listed here are the ones that are have been documented to have morels around them the most frequently but again they've been found in all kinds of places they've been found in um roadside ditches and they've been found in people's yards and in wood chips they I mean they're really all over the place but knowing your trees is going to help you find them a lot more quickly than just wandering around trying to find them so when you actually find a morel how do you identify it well they're pretty uniform in shape you can see that they're very conical at the top that for their cap it's very cone-like um, as of right now, there are 14 known species of Morchella, which is the genus. Um, but they're all, this description kind of covers all of those bases. Um, they're also covered in pits and ridges that go in toward the center of the cap rather than folds. And I'll talk about the folds in Gyromitra, which is actually a false morel, in the next slide. Um, true morels also have a cap that is attached directly to the stem. As you can see in this image right here, this arrow is pointing that at the very base of that cap, it's attached to the rest of the stem right here. Also note that the cap is attached to the stem all the way to the very top of the cap. So you can see that pretty clearly in this image. Um, its color can be really var variable, and that's because there are so many different species of morel. There are black morels, yellow morels, I mean, all kinds. So they usually range in color from yellow, tan, gray, grayish black, or even an olive color. Um, the most important field characteristic I want you to keep in mind, though, is that when you slice a mushroom in half from top to bottom, just like this picture is right here, you'll notice that it's completely hollow in that stem. There's nothing inside of it. There are no holes or chambers. There's no cottony-like fiber. It's just completely hollow. And that's the number one identification that I want you to remember. And remember that the bottom of the cap is always attached to that stem, okay? So let's talk about some false morels that you're most likely to experience or maybe run into in the coming months. The first one is Gyromitra, which is a false morel and that's a genus. So there are several species within this that are still considered a false morel. Um, and the second one are stink horns or the genus phallus. Now, let's talk about these gyromitras first because they're the ones that you're gonna encounter in the springtime and they often cause people problems. And there is a lot of controversy about whether these gyromitras are actually edible or not. Um, for the sake of safety, um, I just tell people flat out that they're not edible. And that's because when your body actually metabolizes these mushrooms, it converts the toxin, toxin in there to the equivalent of rocket fuel, and that's, that's really poisonous. And you don't want that kind of stuff in your body, and it's likely to make you really ill. So just avoid these at all costs um, if you can. But let's talk about the comparison between these gyromitras and um, true morels. So the cap is irregular in shape. As you can see from these images, they're just kind of all over the place and they're very globular and brain-like. They also have wrinkles or wrinkly folds, but not any pits. So you can see right here, these are very wrinkly looking, kind of like your skin after you've been sitting in the water for too long. Um, it's not pitted like the true morel is. They're also reddish to brownish in color. You can see this different coloration in here. Remember those true morels are yellow, tan, olivey, um, those colors. But when you start seeing ones that are this more on the red side, I would steer clear of those just to be safe. They're often wider than they are tall. So you can see here, um, they're pretty wide. 
Um, this one looks like it's probably wider than it is tall, but, but that's kind of a rule of thumb. It's not always the case. Mushrooms tend to have a lot of variability, so that's just kind of a quick way to tell. The best way to tell if you're looking at a true morel or a false morel, like these gyromitras, is to cut them in half. So when you cut them in half, you'll find that they're actually chambered. Um, their flesh is, has holes all over inside of it. And you can see that in this top image. This is um, it cut in half and it's not hollow all throughout. There are holes in here and some flesh that's um, filling in those spaces. So that's one that you need to look out for in the spring. And I chose to talk about this one because it's the one you're most likely to encounter this time of year. Um, the next one I wanna talk about are stink horns. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, that's really obvious, they're stinky. But the problem is that when flies and other insects eat all that slime off the top of it, it looks somewhat like a morel. And um, the big difference between true morels and these stink horns is that stink horns only fruit in the summertime, not in the spring. So you're not likely to find them the same season as morels, but I get a lot of questions about um, late morels popping up in the summer, but it's not very likely unless you have a really cool summer with lots and lots of moisture. Here in Kansas, um, in the Wichita area, or at least central to the western part of the state, it's not likely that you're gonna see true morels in the summertime, so just be aware of that. Also, stink horns are hollow like true morels, but again, these guys only grow in the summer and not in the spring months. So what happens if you accidentally pick a mushroom and you might be getting sick from it? Well, first of all, be very, very careful with your identification because if you have any doubts whatsoever, the cardinal rule is when in doubt, just throw that mushroom out. Um, it's, rather, it's better to be safe than sorry. If you've never eaten a morel before, you wanna keep a whole uncooked one for identification purposes, just in case there are adverse effects when you eat them. Um, also, if you end up feeling ill after eating a mushroom, always call your local poison control. And I'm gonna emphasize local because only, um, not all species of mushrooms grow throughout the United States. Morels are a bit of an exception. They kind of grow all over the place, but always contact your local poison control because maybe the mushroom you ate only grows within a certain region and they'll be help you, able to help you a lot better. Also, a really important thing to keep in mind is even if you find a morel, you'll want to avoid eating it if it looks rotten. This image that I have up here, this one on the left is kind of losing its luster. You can see from the white ridges here that it's drying out and getting kind of crunchy. This one's probably still okay, but once it starts getting really dried out and desiccated looking, or it looks like a bunch of bugs have eaten it, um, definitely don't eat it because you can get sick from eating something, a rotten mushroom, just like you can get sick from drinking bad milk or eating a rotten tomato or really anything like that. So again, when in doubt, throw it out. Always seek a second opinion if you're not sure. Study up with field guides. If you have questions about field guides, I'd be happy to provide you with some good resources. In the coming months, the Great Plains Nature Center is gonna release a new pocket guide on uh, common mushrooms, so keep an eye out for that. So once you get these picked, how are you gonna clean them? Well, there are a couple of different methods that some people swear by, and I'm gonna probably tell you the opposite of that. So most of these mushrooms actually only need to be brushed off because there's a little bit of sandy debris on them or a little bit of dirt. Um, if they seem to be a little bit more buggy, and yes, bugs do like to eat morels, just like humans do. They're a very tasty and nutritious snack for them. But if they're, they do seem to be a bit buggy, you can put them in a colander, um, swoosh them around in a tub of really cold water. And I emphasize cold because if you use hot water, you actually start to cook those mushrooms. Um, avoid using salt water and or soaking them in water or water with salt in it because it tends to make them really soggy and it takes away the texture and the salt can kind of remove the flavor for the, from them, in, in my opinion. Um, you can also use a nozzle if you have one attached to your sink and just hose them off really well. But again, I would avoid soaking them because it takes away all that really awesome texture and it kind of cuts down on the almost nutty like flavor that you get from them. So once you get those mushrooms cleaned off, we gotta cook them. And it's really important that you always cook them completely and never eat them raw. And that's because they do contain a very mild toxin, but that gets broken down when it gets cooked. So once it's cooked completely, there's nothing to worry about. Um, 
there are a lot of different ways to cook mushrooms. You can fry them, you can put them in soup, you can saute them, you can make them into a risotto. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways. You can, you can pickle them, you can, um, man, I don't know. There's a, there's a ton of different ways. So utilize the internet. It's a great resource for delicious morel recipes. Um, remember, always cook them just to be on the safe side. And then my personal preference is put them, after you get them all cleaned off, put them in a pan, butter with salt, pepper, and a little bit of garlic, and ah, oh, they're heaven. They're really good on toast too. So now that you know um, what to take with you, and you know what to look for and how to identify them, you know which ones to avoid, and how to tell the difference between a true morel and a false morel, um, Get out there and start hunting, but remember to share the woods. Morels are abundant and there are a lot of them on public lands and state parks, and um, you probably won't be the only one out there looking for them. Also, be mindful of other critters, and if you do happen to find another animal out there, just give it some space and it's likely to leave you alone if you leave it alone. And with that, I'll see if I can answer any questions that might be popping up on our newsfeed, but thanks for hanging out with me today and um, stay healthy.